So if you have your Bible this morning, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 9. I'm going to conclude this series by talking about an interesting thing that you find in scriptures that in order to experience God, you have to lose in order to win. Hello, somebody. That would just preach. Luke chapter 9, God speaks about the fact that sometimes in his economy, an L is a win. And a win sometimes is a loss, depending on your perspective. But look at this. Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 23. Jesus said this to the crowd. He said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? Can you say amen? This is what we call a paradox, right? Self-contradicting. How can you win by losing? That's the thing with, with scriptures. It's, it's, it's very upside down. Our world says you need to go find yourself. God says you need to lose yourself. <laughs> you know? So it's a dilemma. It's a, it's a paradox in a sense, right? He said you want to be first be last, <laughs> right? Because the greatest theologian that ever lived said you can't have two number ones that will be 11, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> I'm telling you, that boy's deep. <laughs> right? You can't have two number ones. That makes 11. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Talladega Nights, y'all need to watch good movies. Come on, people. <laughs> but this also reminds me of a show that used to be on TV no long ago. I don't know if you guys were familiar with the show called The Biggest Loser. This show was interesting because it was a competition to lose weight. And the more you lose weight, the more you win. Right? Again, another paradox. The biggest loser was the biggest winner in this situation. Right? The more you shed, the more you were winning. And so it's interesting that, that Jesus is telling us here that sometimes you win by losing. You take an L, but it's actually a win in God's economy, right? And sometimes when you think you're winning, you might be losing, right? Are you following so far this morning? So some wins are losses and some losses are win, depending on your perspective and the experience that God is trying to have with you. Let me just make it a little bit more practical. Let me give you some examples of this paradox, right? Sometimes you, you lose entitlement, you win gratitude, right? Sometimes you lose selfishness, you win purpose, right? You lose friends, but you might win a family, right? Sometimes you lose pride, but you come away with humility, right? Sometimes you lose comfort, but you win an experience. And when you wrap it all up, sometimes you lose religion, but you gain a relationship with the Lord. So tell your neighbor, man, it's okay to lose sometimes because you might be winning. Now, I need you to write this down today that you will not experience God's will without making some major adjustments. If this is true, that I need to make some adjustments in my life in order to win the right way, right? Because here's the thing, you can't stay where you are and go with God. You catch that? You can't stay where you are and go where God wants you to go. You can't stay where you are and do what God's calling you to do. This is the paradox, like you cannot be two places at the same time. Something's got to give if you're going to experience the will of God over your life. When I was 20 years old, God got a hold of my life. And there were some major adjustments that came with that. I knew that I couldn't go to certain places anymore. Not because I can't, like, you know, I'm a religious person, I can't go there. No, it's more like I found purpose and that place no longer fits that purpose that God has for me. So I had to lose 
certain environments in order to embrace God's will for my life. I had to lose certain friends in order to embrace the will and the purpose that God had for me. I had to lose certain lifestyles in order to fully embrace the will of God for my life. You cannot be two places at the same time. This is the conflict that a lot of us are in this morning. You're here, but your mind is still in the world. Can't be two places at the same time. You become a living paradox. You're winning and losing all at the same time. You're up and you're down. You're in and you're out. You're carry perry all over the place. So one of the things that needs to take place for you to fully experience God, you have to begin to make some major adjustments. If you're serious about God, if you just want to be religious, you can continue on that path. But if you're serious about embracing God's will for your life, it comes with some major adjustments. Four years ago, there was another major adjustment. He said, go to New Bedford. In order to go to New Bedford, I had to leave Pawtucket. I couldn't do New Bedford from Pawtucket. I had to physically move myself, my family, pregnant with our fourth. In the middle of all these, God says, go, pick up and go because I have something bigger that I want to do in you and through you. And I can't do it if you stay where you are. Right? It, takes, it takes major adjustments if we're truly going to experience God's will for our lives. It takes zero adjustments if you want to be religious. Just keep doing what you're doing. Right? But it takes major adjustments if I really want to see the fullness of God's will in my life. Can you say amen? amen. Now, the reality is all of us in this room are on a unique journey. So the key this morning, if you tune in, if your heart is open, if your mind's receptive, what you need to do this morning is begin to ask the question, God, where do I need to make adjustments? And to help us this morning, I want to give you some areas that all of us, I believe this, if you're paying attention to the voice of the Lord today, one of these areas has to do with you. Because, I, because God is never satisfied with leaving you where you are. He's always ready to take you somewhere better than where you are this very moment. Right? So, so let's look at these areas because I believe this is what we've been talking about this last 11 weeks. These are the areas that all of us need to say, okay, Lord, where do I need to make adjustments in order to fully experience your will for my life? All of us are different. The, the person next to you might be in a different category right now of what God is trying to do in their lives. And everyone who's paying attention will say, okay, God, where? Is it circumstances? Is it in my job? Is it in my home? Is it in my finances? Where do I need to make an adjustment to fully experience your will? For some people, it's relationships, family relationships, friendships, business. I remember one time, uh, one, of our, one of our men here who owns a business, he said God was clear to him that if, you're, if I'm going to bless your business, you cannot be paying people under the table. He had to make an adjustment in how he was approaching his business. And when he did, God blew it up and blessed his business beyond measure. So you got to make the adjustment. If God says it, you have to obey it. Right? This is not just knowing. It's about doing what he says to do. Right? Some of us is in our thinking. Prejudice. Strongholds in our minds and our hearts and how we have gone about life for so long. Our methods or planning. Some of us is commitments. Right? Some people are committed to being uncommitted. <laughs> I'm going to let that sit for a second. You know, some people are adamant about not committing. And you're wondering why your relationships are not going anywhere. Right? Commitment to family or to church. Like some of y'all, you've been coming for a long time, but have you taken the next step to serve, to actually contribute and I just consume? Hello, somebody. I'm preaching this morning. We need adjustments. Some people, it's in your actions, how you pray or give or serve. Is your wallet being saved yet? <laughs> some of us, is in our beliefs. What do you believe about God? His purpose. And his ways. If you're paying attention this morning, I guarantee you the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm talking to you. Tell your neighbor, he's talking to you. He's talking to you this morning. Where do I need to make adjustments in order to fully experience the will of God for my life? 
I want to give you an example of someone in scriptures who had to make a major adjustment in order to experience God's will for their lives. Powerful, powerful thing here. And if you're paying attention, it's also about you. In Kings, you find the story of a prophet named Elijah. A prophet named Elijah felt that God called him to call another person named Elisha. Now, two different people, Elijah and Elisha. These are fun names in the Bible. You know, great names for your kids if, um, if you're looking for one. God says, I want you to call this Elisha to be a prophet. But first, he's got to follow in order to become who I'm calling him to become. Right? And so watch this. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, with another great name. There you go. <laughs> Write it down. Watch this. He was plowing a field. In other words, his work, this was his work, agriculture. He was plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12 team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders. Now, it's important for you to understand this real quick. In this context, right, can you give me that, that for a second? They used to have these cloaks. It was their prayer show or their prayer um, blanket, if you want to call it, and they would have it like this. It's a Jewish tradition, and they would walk with it, and when they would pray, they would bring it over their heads, and they would go into what they call their prayer closet. Your prayer closet is not necessarily a physical place. It's where you are in your spirit. So they say we close in and we go into God to pray and to receive what he has for us. And so he takes this cloak, and he puts it on his friend Elisha, and he says this is a symbol that God has put a calling on your life. For you to follow him. See, the anointing is not in the, in the sheet. The anointing is in the presence of God that anoints the sheet to say, come and follow to receive what God has for you. So here's what happens, right? And so he does that. And watch this. This is really cool. It's really powerful. I love the Bible. I, know, I hope you do. Uh, it's so cool, right? He threw his cloak around his shoulder and then he walked away. He threw it. It bounced. <laughs> and you got to pay attention to these things because they're so important. Well, you have to understand what God is doing here. God will always tag you and say, are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming? I'm not going to babysit you. Are you coming? I've called you already. I tagged you already. I touched you already. Are you going to stay where you are? Are you going to come with me to where we're going? You can't be two places at the same time. You better make up your mind. Today is God tagged you. You better come with God and where he's trying to take you. He's not playing games, church. He's got time to babysit. Oh, I know. I know you're in a bad relationship. Oh, I know. I know things. Tell me about it. What's the matter? God's like, you better get up and come with me. You better come. God never throws pity parties. That's you, yourself, and you. God's like, I'm in the business of changing things. I'm not in the business of keeping things the same. When God tags you, you better run. He's tagging somebody this morning. And he's saying, you better come after me. My goodness. He walks away. And watch this. Elisha left the oxen standing there. Ran. He ran. Right? That's when you know you're serious about experiencing God. This was not... You know, let me pray about it. Some people get stuck in the praying about, praying about, praying about, praying about, praying. He didn't pray about it. He ran to God's will. That's the difference between two people in this room today. Someone will get stuck in praying about it. Someone's like, yo, I'm going after what God says. Have any runners in this house? This morning, he ran to the will of God. Watch this. Watch this. He gets, gets, gets getting better. I love the Bible. It's so, so good. I hope you read it. It's awesome. Watch this. He said, he said he ran, right? And he said, first, let me go 
kiss my father and mother goodbye. Then I will go with you. Because in those days, when a prophet calls you, it was a full-time following. I want to let you know something clear this morning. You may not be called to be a full-time pastor, but you're called to be a full-time Christian. This is not a weekend thing. This is not a weekend, you know, I'm going to give God the, the Sunday thing. I'm going to do my thing. Listen, you will never fully experience the God if you're not giving him your full life 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. When you say, God, I'm coming after you. This is not a part-time thing. It's a full-time following. It's a lifestyle of doing God's will. Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. Go on back, but think about the fact that there's a calling on your life now. And when God puts a call on your life, where you are becomes miserable. Right. Hello, somebody. When God puts a taste in your mouth about his will and his purpose, the world begins to taste bitter and, and it's frustrating because you're like, man, I, I used to drink this thing, but now it's just, just it's tasteless. It doesn't make any sense. I used to go to this place, but now I'm looking around. I'm like, what am I doing here? Because when God tags you, nothing else will satisfy Nothing else is going to satisfy you. Now, you may try to be that person who stays there, but you will never feel settled there. <laughs> oh, my. Am I preaching this morning? It keeps getting better. It keeps getting better. Verse 20, so Elisha returned to his oxen. Remember, this is his livelihood. This is what he did for a living. And he slaughtered them. He killed it. Not only did he slaughter them, watch this. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast the flesh. He passed it around the meat to the townspeople. They all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Did you catch that? Elijah had a bonfire. He had a barbecue. Understand what Elijah was doing here. He used, what are you doing? I'm trying to preach. Come with me, you're supposed to be running. He used the wood from the plow, catch this. He used the very thing that he was using for his livelihood. He took it. He burned it. Why? Because when God calls you, you better start a bonfire with your past so you don't have that desire to go backwards. He burned the bridge. He said, I'm never going back to that. I'm going forward in God's will. You better start a bonfire in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit to say, I'm a new person. I am never going back. Put a match to it. Strike a light to it. I am not a person I used to be. Thank God I'm not that person anymore. And in order for me to go forward, I'm never going to be tempted to go back. Why? Because I let it burn. You better let it burn this morning if you want God's will. You better put on some usher and let that relationship burn. Some of y'all need to run to this altar today and say, God, I'm going to let them burn. So you're not tempted to go back. He burned it. Talk about burning bridges. Some bridges are worth burning. So you're never tempted to go back anymore. Because you're not who you used to be. And thank God. And your past is your past. He burned it. He didn't pray about it. He lit a fire on this thing. He started a giant bonfire. Today, there ought to be some people smelling like smoke in this place, saying goodbye to your past, goodbye to that thinking, goodbye to that relationship, goodbye to that thing, goodbye to that environment, goodbye to that person, goodbye, goodbye. I said goodbye to that thing. Smell something burning in this place. Something's got to burn if you want God's will. Something's got to give 
if you want God's will. You got to burn the bridge of the past to fully see the will of God being manifested in your life today. Elijah burned the bridge of his past in order to experience God's will for him. In other words, I'm never going to be tempted to go back because there's nothing to go back to. There's nothing to go back to. I'm not trying to taste the waters. I have dove into the deep end and there's no going back to the same old. You got to ask yourself the question today, what or who do I need to let burn? Because you got to lose in order to win. Sometimes you got to take that L, but that L is the greatest win you will ever have in your entire life. The cross was an L from a natural standpoint. It looked like a loss. But it was the greatest act of redemption in the history of humanity because three days later, he rose again from the dead and paid for your sins and rescued you. It may look like an L, but it's a win in God's economy. Your greatest loss today could be your greatest victory. Some people are conflicted because they have a lost in order to win. Yeah, the world preaches to you every day, find yourself, explore, sleep around, do all this stuff. And the more we do that, the more lost we're becoming. When there's a God saying, come lose yourself so that you may really find yourself, so that you may live and live and have life to the fullest. I came to give you life and life more abundant. Life more abundant means it's above and beyond what your expectations are. I came to give you life. Are you willing to make the adjustments to see the will of God? Are you willing to sacrifice in order to win? See, God says that it's not sacrifice. What I'm looking for is obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You could be doing something that looks really good, but if you're not, if you're not obeying, it means absolutely nothing. That's religion. Religion says, I'm going to be good. But when are you ever going to be good enough when you're standing before a holy God? He's the one that makes you who you're supposed to be. Listen, God, when he calls you to do something, because he's going to empower you to make it happen. When you're trying on your own willpower, that's you. But when you say, God, I'm, a, I'm abandoning myself for you, then he's like, I'm going to fill you with my power, with my wisdom with my abilities, with my discernment for you to be able to accomplish what I've called you to accomplish. This is not something you can do in your own strength. I don't know if you caught this, but today we read basically Christianity in a nutshell. It's the whole thing in one verse. He says basically this, deny yourself. Say goodbye to that old life. Take up your cross. That's your new purpose. And then follow. That's the new normal. Right? You can't stay there once he tags you. You got to follow. You got to come with where he's trying to take you. Most people will hear the message and will think about it, but will never run. That's the sad reality of church sometimes. People are like on the verge of winning, but can't find themselves to take that loss first in order to actually win. Some people will stop coming, and then they look back. Why? Because they never burned it. It never burned it. It was always an option to go back. It was always an option to be in church, but then go live like something else during the week. It was always an option that, you know, if things don't work out, maybe we can see what could happen. But we've been doing that for three, four, five, six years, and we're still in this limbo. It's time to let something burn in order to see the will of God come to pass. You ready to be ushered this morning? Let something burn in order to really live. Sometimes it's the religious mindset. Just that mindset of, uh, I'm a good person. Yes, yeah, so what? But what are you doing with your life? Right? He's not that bad. Wait, that's the, that's the standard? The stand, that's, that's a low bar. He's not that bad. Well, anyone can do that. 
what do you need to let burn in order to really live the will that God has for you? The power of the Holy Spirit comes so that you may live above the level of sin and mediocrity. God doesn't want you to keep hitting the same wall. God doesn't want you to just keep going through the same loophole. God doesn't want you to just get caught up in this thing, trying hard during the week and then have an hour or two in the week. No, no, no. God wants you to have a lifestyle of achieving, of accomplishing, of healing, of restoration, and power to live like his people. Like you had to look like him. But in order to look like him, you first got to let some things burn. You got to be willing to sacrifice. He said, the greatest sacrifice you can ever give God is your life. He says, now that you understand what Jesus has done for you, the only thing left to do is to say, Lord, here I am. I'm going to offer my life to you as a living sacrifice. I want to be holy and pleasing to you. That's my reasonable act of worship. I don't want to conform to the ways of this world, which tells me I got to find myself. I got to explore. Now I want to be transformed. I want to renew my mind so that I may know your perfect, pleasant, and will for my life. That's the true calling of Jesus. If we make this a weekend thing, we missed it. That's the calling of Jesus. And I believe if you pay attention today, he's speaking to all of us in this place. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You need the fresh touch of the Holy Spirit to say, fill me so that I may really be able to have the strength to burn some things. Because if he doesn't, you'll go back. But what do we sing today? We rise out of the what? Ashes. Come on. Something has to burn for you to rise up out of the ashes to have a resurrected life. Would you stand with me today as we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit? Listen, today is a day to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit.